Good morning, everyone. Uh, let us pray. Dear Father, uh, you greater, and we thank you for the grace that you've given us. Um, thank you for the opportunity to gather here today and worship you and praise you uh, for all the blessings that you've uh, brought into our lives. We want to lift up um, today uh, the families and the victims of those affected by, um, by Hurricane Dorian. And I pray that in this time of, uh, of hardship and challenge that they find in you uh, peace and, and comfort. Um, I lift up uh, the deployed spouse and their families. In this time, I pray that you keep them safe and bring, give your support uh, to those staying home. We want to praise you, Father, for this amazing week in which we have uh, seen life being born. Um, especially we want to lift up the Baldwins and the Johnsons for the birth of their baby boys. And we thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here and, uh, and just praise you. Uh, we love you, Father. I pray that you bless us with your presence and allow us to have a, a wonderful uh, worship time. In Jesus' name we pray.
Welcome to Adriano Baptist Church. Um, my name is Renu Rafamo, and I'm one of the deacons here. Uh, first, want to extend um, a welcome to our first-time guest, and I hope that as you uh, uh, came here, you uh, receive one of those uh, packages. In these packages, you will have information about our various ministries, as well as um, ministry leaders and opportunities for you to volunteer. So if you have um, any questions, um, feel free to reach out to uh, all the contacts that are listed in this uh, package. And we want you to know that uh, wherever you are in your walk with Christ, Adriano Baptist Church is a place where uh, we want to help you uh, know and love Jesus more. So in order for us to do that, um, if you would uh, flip your bulletin uh, to the tell us about yourself section and please fill out this uh, form. And all that we ask from you is that you drop this form in uh, offering plates uh, later on in service. We also have uh, a section on the back of the bulletin um, called prayer request. So if there is in any way uh, that we can pray for you, uh, uh, please uh, fill out this uh, form and just drop it in a, in a bucket um, in the offering plate uh, later on in the, uh, during the service. And now we'd like to add, uh, draw your attention to uh, the back of the bulletins uh, for the announcements um, that we'll have this week. Uh, first, uh, we have the 101 Discipleship, uh, which has the winter session has started. And so if you would like to um, have more information about this 101 Discipleship, uh, feel free to contact Pastor Barry uh, to get signed up. Uh, furthermore, we have Awana update. So tonight is not going to be the start of Awana. Uh, Awana starts uh, next Sunday on the 15th. Uh, so tonight will just be the uh, leader training, leader training night. <coughs> and so uh, if you haven't got your, ch uh, your, your kids uh, registered, uh, please don't forget to do so on, on our website. And the uh, the contact uh, for Awana is Rachel Oden, and our email is listed on the, the bulletin. Uh, furthermore, next Friday, on the 13th of September, we're going to have a men uh, dinner. And so this is going to be an opportunity for the men to, to get to know one another, fellowship with one another, and, um, and share a meal, uh, as well as study um, in the process. So I hope that, um, you know, you guys can join us next Friday. Uh, it's going to be here in a fellowship uh, hall downstairs. And um, yeah, it's going to be a great time. So if you have any question about it, uh, feel free to uh, reach out to me. Um, my email is on here as well as my uh, phone number. So on the 15th of sem September, we're going to have a membership class. Uh, this is going to be an opportunity um, for us to let us know about our vision and uh, our values here at Adiano Baptist Church. And so Pastor Barry will be um, holding this class uh, on the 15th of September at 17.30. Um, so if you have any question about it, uh, feel free to uh, email him or uh, you know, shoot him a, a text. On the 22nd of September, we're gonna have a baptism service. Uh, so if you're interested in getting baptized, um, reach out to Pastor Barry for more information on, on that as well. And on the 29th of September at uh, noon after the second service, we're going to have a new co news com uh, newcomer lunch. Um, so if you've recently joined Adiano Baptist Church and would like to know more about um, various opportunities to serve uh, within the church and fellowship with uh, um, other church members and get to know uh, the leaders of those ministry, uh, feel, um, please join us on the 29th of September after the second service. Uh, it's going to be downstairs in the fellowship hall, and um, we'll have um, food um, for all of you. Um, but what we ask from you is to uh, RSVP by the 26th of September so that we can, um, you know, provide enough food for everybody. And uh, lastly, um, I just want to mention that um, at Adiano Baptist Church, we have various ministries, um, and those ministries will not uh, function if it were not for all the volunteers, and so that means you. And um, so we have uh, 
important need of volunteers uh, for our ministries, whether it's uh, um, children ministries, reading ministries, worship team, and um, the AV booth back there. We need you to, to help us, you know, uh, make sure that the service is run properly and we can cater to uh, all our um, Avenue Baptist Church family. So if you feel uh, a need, um, you know, to serve or want to know, um, want to have more information about it, uh, feel free to reach out to Pastor Barry or me and then we can um, uh, guide you toward those uh, various opportunities that we do have here. So as we continue our, um, our worship service, uh, let's uh, take a moment to greet one another in the name of the Lord. As you return to your seats, please join us in worship.
watching him just dance around. It's like he had that joy of the Lord. <laughs> Please come forward for the tithes and offering.
And as the offering plate passes by, feel free to stand after it's passed. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good.
Well, good morning. My name is Sam Owens, and I have the privilege of standing in for Brother Barry today. For those of you who don't know me, for 14 years from October 2001 to November 2015, I had the joy of serving as pastor of this church, and I'm still hanging around. You know, bad pennies never go away. So, uh, and I occasionally I get this special privilege, and I certainly enjoy it. I, before I start, I want you to notice one thing. I have in my hand here a Bible, and here's my iPad with my sermon. I lay my Bible here, put my iPad on top of it, so you know my sermon is resting solidly on the Word of God. You got that? Okay. <laughs> now, uh, my wife is all shook up because I'm preaching today, and she wanted to give me a haircut. I said, no, no, honey, don't do that. They never get to see a hair in the pulpit over there. Leave it alone. <laughs> um, I, I sent Brother Barry a message asking for permission to do that, and he didn't respond, so... Silence is affirmative, right? <laughs> I got to think about it. You know, it doesn't matter if the sun's shining on a bare rock or a snow-covered rock. It's going to blind your eyes anyway, so there you go. Uh, I think I've got this thing turned on. Renny, I don't know. Uh, one thing quick right here. Would you please check and see, did you lose your base gas card on your way into church this morning? I have it here in my hand. If you can describe it, quote the number from by heart and... We'll check it for DNA and fingerprints and all that stuff, make sure. It's, but it was someone found it and turned it in. So if you check and you lost your gas card, right here it is. Now, another thing. I put out there on the table to the left of the exit a stack of little business cards. One side's printed in English, one in Italian. And it's a thing called, in English, the Church of Life Eternal. I have started a blog ministry online to share the biblical truth about eternal life with Italian people. If you talk to Italian people about salvation and eternal life, you'll, you'll know right away they don't have a clue. They know what the Catholic Church has told them about all the things they have to do to get there. They don't know anything about the biblical truth concerning eternal life. So the purpose of this entire blog, I, the, the Church of Life Eternal, I have only its own line only. It's not somewhere you meet. On the back side, it's in Italian, and what I do with it is I take it with me, and I meet someone I want to give it to, and I just say, I just point to that subject, life eternal, and I say, if you're interested in this, go to that website and read these articles. There are four of them posted so far. Uh, just tell them, go to that website, read those articles. They'll get solid biblical truth, which, yes, conflicts tremendously with what they've been learning in Catholic churches all their lives, but it's God's truth. You may give to your landlord, any Italian friends, acquaintances, co-workers, whatever. They're there. If you, if you want to use them, take them. Uh, there's a stack of them on the desk out there, and you can take them with you. All right. You heard the announcement now two weeks in a row that on the 22nd, there's going to be baptism service here. And I talked to Brother Barry, and he does what I always did. <laughs> Sometime during that service, you're going to hear words about being buried with Christ in baptism, risen to walk in newness of life. Risen to walk in newness of life. I want to spend this time today talking with you about five characteristics of newness of life. I want you to use it as a checklist in your own life. Where do I stand where that point right there is concerned? Now, I want you to kind of in your mind. Anybody here, has anybody here ever shelled fresh peas? Open the pot. Okay. Try to imagine a pea pod. You open it up and there are five little peas and they're all lined up nice and tight and snug. They're very comfortable, right? And they, they're not going to move. But if you move one of those peas, the other four are free to move around any way they want to. You move two of them and they've got more room. So I want you to find, your life is not complete if one of the peas is missing in the pod of your life. So I want you to understand that. Now, I, I uh, early on in my life, I got in the habit of, Making all my points start with the same letter, alliterating as best I could if I don't have to strain, and this works well today. So you're going to get five little P's. Now, point number one, I had to struggle with a little bit because there are lots of P's that apply to this new life. I could have called it a purchased life. Uh, both 1 Corinthians 6.20 and 7.23 tell us that we have been bought with a price. It is a purchased life. It's no longer ours. It belongs to someone else. I could have called it a providential life. God, in his providence, in his rich mercy, in his sovereignty, 
chose to give us this new life. I, I could have called it a perfected life. I don't, I don't really hold a lot with a lot of bumper sticker theology like you see in the United States, but the one that says Christians aren't perfect, just perfected, that's good theology. Uh, in uh, places like Psalm 103.12, you learn that all your transgressions have been removed as far as the east is from the west. And in 2 Corinthians 5.21, you, you, you learn that we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ, and there's nothing more perfect than the righteousness of God, and that's what we became. So it, I could have called it a per perfected life. But there are, is a problem in churches today that led me to use the term that I am going to use today. It's this one right here, um, a penitent life, a penitent life. A life based on repentance. You see, there has become something of a plague in churches today. It's called easy believism. Some 30 or 40 years ago, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, people who know how to ask the right questions when they poll people, they visited Baptist churches all across the United States of America to search and see how many people are truly born-again believers. And they came away with this very frightening conclusion. Fully 40% of the people who sit in Baptist churches week after week have never been saved. And the reason for that is they have uttered some little prayer expressing faith in Jesus Christ without repentance. So they're not saved. In Acts 20:21, 20, Paul tells all his people he's writing to and speaking to that he never failed to preach to both Greeks and Gentiles and, and Jews repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. Repentance comes first. When Jesus began his preaching ministry, we see in Mark chapter 1, he preached repentance. Repentance. If it's missing, something bad is wrong. Now, I want to back up here just a moment. This is the text we're going to see, and this is what you'll hear next week in church. Just uh, watch, please, as I read it along here. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? That's a good definition of repentance, died to sin. Or do we not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even, though, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Another good definition of repentance. Pray with me, please. Father in heaven, we open your word before us. Our hearts before you, we ask you, Lord, to speak to us. You know every one of us in this room. You know all the circumstances of our life. You know everything that's ever happened to us is happening now and is going to happen in the future. Lord, you know us better than we know ourselves. I don't know what you have in store for these people today. I just know this sermon is heavy on my heart, so I just ask you to use it, Lord, in whatever way you choose to have your perfect will in every one of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It is easy to come to Jesus and pray a simple little prayer expressing faith, hoping that he'll pay the fire insurance for you, and you'll never have to worry about going to hell. Then get up and go on and live just like you always lived. I know people who have done that. I've seen the consequences of it. I myself did it once as a 15-year-old kid. Had no intention of changing my lifestyle, but I did want to be forgiven for all my naughtiness and mischief and evil <laughs> that was part of my teenage life. I know about that. It's easy to say, Lord, please forgive me. Don't ask me to change. When Jesus comes into your life, something is going to change. Repentance always comes first in the salvation formula. I call that little verse, Acts 20, 21, God's two-ingredient recipe for salvation. Somebody somewhere along the line may have given you one of those three-ingredient cookbooks. Uh, somebody gave my wife one not long after we were married, a three-ingredient cookbook. And she started looking at it and realized some of this stuff's pretty hard. So she, she, she developed an idea. I take anything I want to, add salt and pepper to it, that's three ingredients. So 
That's how we've been living all these years. <laughs> repentance first and then faith. Now, in seminary, I learned this definition of repentance, and I want to just give it to you right quick. Repentance is a change of the mind that leads to a change of the heart, which leads to a change of the will, which leads to a change of lifestyle. If, you, if nothing about you has changed, you haven't repented. And you need to examine yourself to understand, I need to repent. Religions such as Catholicism that teach that one can confess their sins, perform some little act of penitence that the priest will give you, go out and stand on the street corner and say the Lord's Prayer ten times and say Hail Mary's five or six times and your sin will be absolved. And, and you can just go on doing whatever you're doing. Uh, we, we have a little home down in uh, southern Italy we've had for many, many years. And uh, mafiosi people live on either side of us. I've been told we got the safest piece of property in southern Italy as long as they don't start shooting at each other across our <laughs> little piece of our little lot there. I, I, I see one of the guys, he, he's kind of a, a, a relative of my wife. She's not a mafiosa, but he is. Um, I've seen him walk around uttering little prayers and picking out, taking pictures of, of Mary out of his pocket and kissing them, putting them back. But I know his life has never changed. He's still a mafioso. He's a bad dude. But the church says that's okay just as long as you come and, and, and we'll clean it up for you. And then, yeah, yeah, you're going to go to purgatory someday to pay for the ones you didn't get confessed. But yeah, it's no big deal. You'll make it to heaven eventually. They don't know anything about eternal life. You and I know this. Now listen, the biblical doctrine of salvation says repent first and then trust Jesus Christ. Whenever a person gets this point right, the next three should flow automatically. Now, I started out here with this thing here. In point one, I'm seeking to instruct. In points two through three, no, matter, no, no, no doubt I will probably interfere and intrude, maybe even irritate. And then in uh, point number five, I hope to inspire. So just fasten your seatbelts and let's go. Point number two, the new life Risen to walk in newness of life. The new life is a prepared life. It is a prepared life. When you give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ, you become a member of his eternal family. You sign on to the greatest work that your life will ever know. How to serve God, to glorify him, and help him expand his kingdom. There is nothing greater than the life of a Christian and our mission as Christians in the world. And yes, you were born again with a mission. With a mission. And I want you to understand that you must prepare. You guys are military. You study. You train. You work. You learn. You prepare yourself for that day when somebody say, hey, the big balloon just went up. It's time to go to war. You prepare yourself because you know how important your work is. You moms, uh, you, you prepare yourself to be a mom, to be a homemaker. You, you, you learn how to do stuff because it's important. Well, this life you're living, at, this new life, it, it's, it's an important life. And you have an important mission, and we must prepare. Now, I got some Bible here. You, I hope, would expect that. You know the verse in 2 Timothy 2.15. If you don't, you ought to come and sit through Awana with your children. <laughs> 2 Timothy 2.15 be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to know what God's word says so we can apply it to our lives and so that we can apply it to the lives of other people. That is part of our task on earth is to share God's word, his grace, his mercy, his gospel with other people. And we'll get to more, more of that later. But you need to be prepared. You need to study. Uh, I wish all of you had the joy of getting an Italian driver's license the Italian way. Oh, it's so much fun. You have to go to driver school. And I don't care how long you've been driving. You still have to go to driver school. You have to sit through classes where some guy's going to lecture you. He's got this big book. The one that I went to right up the street up here toward Hotel Oliva, the book had 1,750 questions in it. And he tried to teach us the answers to all those questions. I said one night, why, why did we have to learn all this? I said, well, because any of them could be on the test. They're going to give you 30 questions. You don't know what they're going to be. So you've got to learn all 1,750. You've got to get in the car and ride around with some guy six times. 
oftentimes he'd look at me and say, oh, you drive better than I do. I said, well, why are we here? Because the law says you. Oh, I, so you have to study. You have to prepare. You got to know stuff. And, and so it is with the Christian life. We have got to know stuff. Listen to Ephesians 2.10. Most of us evangelical Christians know 8 and 9 of, of Ephesians 2. Saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast, blah, blah. Not many of us get on to verse 10, but oh, we ought to. Because it tells you the why of verses 8 and 9. For we are his workmanship. That word can be translated masterpiece. And that's the way I use it when I preach on it. We are his workmanship, his craftsmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now as a longtime student of the Bible, I love the way the Holy Spirit of God places words in the text. If he had stopped right there at prepared for good works, which God prepared before, and we can say, well, you know, that's just, we're supposed to sit down and just wait and good works are going to happen to us. No, no, no. It says you're supposed to walk around in them. That means your lifestyle. When, when the Bible talks about walk, if you've got the old King James Version, sometimes it'll say your conversation. It means your lifestyle. As you're going through life, you're supposed to be doing good works. You can't do them if you don't know what they are and you don't know how to do them. We have to be prepared. The new life is a penitent life. It is a prepared life. It is a participatory life. I was in Kentucky, my home state, back in the spring. I got a bunch of unsaved kinfolk on my father's side of my family. Got some wonderful Christians there. Got a whole lot of cousins who are just total pagans <laughs> in every sense of the word. I was talking to one of those guys, a guy who was an all-American boy, he went off to college, he came home an atheistic philosopher kind of a guy, and his wife, and talking to him about spiritual things. And finally now, at age, in his, in his 60s, this cousin will at least listen. He won't make any decisions, but he will at least listen. But his wife told me she does her worship walking around in the fields on their farm. Well, good for you. La di da. Where do you find God out there? How do you find any people out there you can share your life with? Walking around in a pasture full of weeds and grass and manure and all that other stuff? That's not worship. That's not participating. It is a participatory life. Now, there's something awfully exciting about this thing. Uh, I've, I've had people tell me they find him at their fishing hole, they find him on the golf course, they find him, you know, people find God everywhere. That, but it's not the God of the Bible. <laughs> it's not the God of the Bible. The new life you've been baptized into by the Spirit of, Holy Spirit of God is a life that participates. Go to 1 Corinthians 12 and read about all the, how the church is all the little members of the body, and there's no, no such thing as an insignificant one. Even our little toes are important. If you don't believe that, hit it against a corner or something some night in the dark. You'll find out how important it is. Everything about us is important. Now, here's, here's what's exciting. First of all, we are participants with God who is within us. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we are his, we are God, God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. God's fellow worker. Oh, my goodness. You get to join hands with Almighty God, walk through life with Him, doing the things He wants you to do, when, where, and how He wants you to do them. You're co collaborating, working with God. I, I love being around important people, and I have had just a few uh, opportunities in my lifetime. It, it kind of makes you feel good to be around, especially if they talk to you. And if they would ask you to join them in doing something, oh, how good that is. I got to work in three Billy Graham crusades in the States during the course of my lifetime. I never got to talk to the man himself. I got to talk to some of his good buddies. I've, I've been in conferences here in Europe where his sister and people came and you know got, got that close to Billy Graham. I never talked to him. But I, I know that I'm working in the same field he's in. And, and just to be, a, be around something and associated with something like that, it makes you feel good. But what about being a participator, a collaborator with Almighty God? There is nothing more exciting. I, I can recall being a young man, a single guy, living for nothing in this world by myself, 
thinking that being a Christian must be the most boring life on earth. You just can't have any fun when you're a Christian. Oh, my goodness, what a fool I was. I have learned now, and, and I hope you have learned, and if you haven't, I hope you will learn very soon. There was a thing called joy. We just got through singing about it. There's a joy inexpressible. I got through writing an article about that just the other day and put it out on Facebook in, in English. <laughs> inexpressible joy is part of our privileges as Christians, and that joy trumps all the fun the world can ever give you. See, fun is something that has to be renewed day after day after day. Joy that God puts in your heart comes and it stays and it never goes away. Now, you can top it up sometimes through your prayers and through your service, etc., but it's always right there. Joy inexpressible and full of glory, the Bible says. A participatory life. The second thing about this participation, we are participations with the Christians who are with us. God within us, fellow Christians with us. We participate with them. Here's what Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, and this is why, by the way, no one should ever try to find God outside the doors of a local church. No one should ever be content with that kind of relationship. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting or encouraging one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Cooperating, collaborating, working with fellow Christians. What a joy it is. What a joy it is. I used to have fits about some of the prayer meetings we'd have in church. And now, let me say this. I go back to a time when Church met Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And if you loved the church, you went Sunday morning. If you loved the pastor, you went Sunday night. If you loved the Lord, you went on Wednesday night, just that way. But we'd have prayer meeting, and we'd ask for prayer request. And people would start. Oh, my poor Aunt Millie's got a hangnail on her left big toe. Oh, somebody I know's got a cold. They've been coughing for two days. Oh, somebody I know their dog is sick. And they'd just give you a whole litany of stuff like that to pray about. And I'm standing here as the pastor taking it. Think, can't anybody out there think of anything big and wonderful and magnanimous to pray about? Can't anybody mention some lost people that need to get saved? Can anybody pray about missions around the world? Can't we pray about something significant? Can't we encourage one another? Can't we pray for the brothers and sisters here in the building with us? Oh, my goodness. Participating with Christians, encouraging them, urging them on to good works, comforting them in their failures, in, in, congratulating them in their successes. There's so much we need to be doing as co-workers with God and with our fellow Christians. When I came to Alabama Baptist in October of 01, this church met three times a week. And I was determined that in this church it's not going to be like it's been in the church that I've served before. So we'd come and we'd have, uh, there'd be just a, like a 10-minute Bible study, and we'd dedicate the rest of the time to prayer. And at the end of it, I'd have all the people hold hands and join in a circle around these two areas right here. And I'd start with the person on my right, say a one-sentence prayer about someone you know that you want to see saved. And we'd go around the entire circle, and they'd all pray just a little one-sentence prayer. Some of them had never opened their mouth in a church, <laughs> in a, in a church before. But they would pray, and I tried my best that way to fit into their minds. There are bigger things to pray about than Aunt Millie's hangnail. There's some really important things. But you get to work with fellow Christians in accomplishing God's magnanimous mission. It's an exciting, exciting thing to do. We go on these mission trips to Moldova, and in the past we've gone into Romania, and I've taken young people out of this church, people I knew but didn't know whole too much about the level of their spirituality and their dedication and to go out there on the mission field with them and see them turn into absolute missionaries right before my eyes. My goodness, what an exciting thing. But you have that joy. You have that joy to help people to fulfill their mission in life as Christian people. Now, point number four, and this one I wish I had all day. I guess, okay, as long as we get done before the next service starts, right? <laughs> The new life, it's penitent, it's prepared, 
It's participatory. It's also productive. It is a productive life. The new life is a productive life. Come with me, please, to John chapter 15. We're just going to read some assorted verses through there, and then I'll share with you a few thoughts about this. In John 15, too, Jesus says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Come down to number four. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Abiding in Christ. 1 John 2, 28 says, abide in him so that when he may appear, you may have confidence, not be ashamed before him at his coming. Scary words, scary words. Verse 8 of John 15. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. In the house where Pastor Barry and Jeannie live, there are two palm trees standing right out, out in front of the house. Big, tall, to me, ugly things. The trunks of them have nothing there you can use. You can't cut it into planks and build anything with it. Up at the top, there are all these fronds. It bears no fruit. It produces no flowers. To me, they're the most useless things on the planet. I just can't understand why anybody would want a tree like that in their yard, especially in the yard of a preacher. <laughs> of course, there's no preacher living there when they plant. But they're useless. They're fruitless. They're flowerless. There's nothing there that you can do. Don't let your Christian life be that way, friends. Don't be like those two palm trees. Next time you're out there, look at them very closely. Say, I don't want my life to be like that. That's useless. That is useless. Now, I retired from the Air Force at Andrews Air Force Base. I was in the hospital there with a health care administrator. I learned one day that there was a, a young man who holds a Bible study at lunch hour, and oh, I got excited. So I started going to this young guy's Bible studies on, on my lunch break. And um, one day he was teaching about bearing fruit. Well, I got excited. I think that's a great topic. But as he went along, he said, now, this thing about bearing fruit, let's come over here to this, this part here and read about the fruit of the Spirit, blah, 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 patience, love, and all that stuff, the fruit of the Spirit. I'm sitting there saying, no, 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 no. That's not what it's talking about. And there came a time when he opened up for questions, and I raised my hand. Excuse me. That fruit of the Spirit, where does it come from? Well, the Spirit gives it to you when you're saved. Yes, He does. I mean, you don't have to bear it. He's already born it and brought it to you. This fruit is something else. No, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. It's talking about something completely different. You can't bear what the Holy Spirit has already given you. That's already there. Now, to clarify this, I want you to come with me to John chapter 4, verses 35 and 36. Now, let me say this. I don't know anyone on earth who mistakes this. It's all about evangelism and pursuing lost people for Christ. And here's what verses 34 and 35 of John chapter 4 say. Do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Those gifts of the Spirit that that young man spoke about, they're great. But they're, I think they're, I, I say there are nine different flavors in that one fruit, but they're all good, and we need them, I mean, and we need to exercise them. But they're not something you can produce yourself. The Holy Spirit produces it in you. This is talking about producing fruit for the kingdom of God. Going out where the Fields are white under harvest and plucking them up and bringing them into the family. Born again, redeemed, repentant Christians walking now in newness of life. Fruit for eternal life. You see those fruits of the Spirit when someone dies, they're going to end right there in that person's life. There is a fruit that's going to last forever. And Jesus was speaking about that in John 4, 36. Fruit unto eternal life. There was a man I had never heard of before until I saw a thing on Netflix that got my attention. It was a 
a thing called the family. I got all excited because several years ago, one of our men here was TDY somewhere, and he met a fella who does Christian ministry in Romania. They became good friends. He came home and said, Pastor, we need to invite him over. He's doing great work with children and teenagers in Romania. Yes, let's invite him. We brought him over. His name was Tito. <laughs> Tito. We brought him here, and he brought some young people. They, were, they could sing, my goodness. They were, and we talked to him about, you know, are you Baptist? No. But we're Christians just like you are. And, and he sold us on that idea. And, man, we went to work. We had a clothing drive. We took up money. We went over to Romania in the eastern part of the country to work with Tito and his Christian uh, in, in reaching children and teenagers for Christ. We're sitting in their big house. They all live in one house together, by the way. That should have been a clue. One of the young ladies is leading the morning Bible study, and she came across something that made all of us, our ears just went straight up. That They call themselves the family. They're a group of people who believe in swapping wives between each other, the leaders exchange wives, blah, blah, blah. It was born in the 1960s by some former hippie in, in Los Angeles. So I, I thought this family on Netflix was about that. So I, I want to see what, to say. but it's a whole different thing. There's another, it's, it's actually not an organization. They refuse to be called an organization. They just call themselves the family. It was started by a man named uh, Abraham Veredi, a man from one of the Scandinavian nations. He's the guy who planted the thought, who founded the National Day of Prayer in Washington, D.C. He was the, the power behind that. And he and his successor have gone around the world in uh, intervening years and have started days of prayer in lots of nations, in Africa and Europe and Asia. Uh, but Abraham Verady said, the only thing from things from this life that we can take with us beyond the pearly gates of heaven are the souls that we have won to Christ. Fruit for eternal life. Now, listen. We have been given a Christian witness based on our salvation. We're supposed to share that witness with lost people. It should be, it's supposed to be a lifestyle function. It's not just something sporadic. Uh, there's a pastor of a mega church in Ohio I saw on TV just last week. <laughs> he was preaching about this very thing, about why Christian people don't witness. And he said, people are always saying, I don't feel led. <laughs> what he had happening during the sermon, he had people going around with plastic cups with little lead split shot sinkers in them, giving everybody in church a little piece of lead to put in their pocket or in their purse. Now, the next time you come upon a witnessing opportunity and you don't feel led, reach in there and touch that thing. I feel led now. I've got to tell this person here about Jesus. Clever. Makes me angry. I never thought of it myself. Listen, you are supposed to be a witness for Jesus Christ. There was a time in church, and I don't know if anybody here remembers. There was a time in church when we sang, we sang hymns, and the hymns were filled with biblical truth. They were there to encourage, to inspire, to exalt God, sometimes to challenge and correct. Uh, they, weren't, weren't, they weren't all about feel good, warm fuzzy and stuff. They were all about teaching people stuff musically. We don't sing them anymore. We're into a whole different mindset nowadays. But here's one that disappeared from the pages of Baptist hymnals way back in the 1960s or 70s. And here are the words. Don't run. I'm not going to sing it, okay? The words to it go like this. Must I go and empty-handed, thus my dear Redeemer meet? Not one day of service give him. Lay no trophies at his feet. Must I go and empty-handed? Must I meet my Savior so? Not one soul with which to greet him. Must I empty-handed go? Not at death I shrink nor falter, for my Savior saves me now, but to meet him in empty-handed, thought of that now clouds my brow. And the last verse of the hymn says, Oh, you saints, arouse, be earnest, up and work, while still tis day, ere the night of death o'ertakes you, strive for souls, while still you may. Share your Christian testimony with somebody and tell them, what God did for me, he'll do for you if you'll just turn to him in faith and let him save you. The penitent prepared to participate in life will be a productive life. It can't miss. 
Point number five, here's the encouragement. The, 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 the new life is a permanent life. It's a permanent life. John 5, 24, my favorite proof text for eternal security, once saved, always saved, says simply this. Jesus is speaking. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word in the present tense and believes in him, believes in the present tense, in him who sent me, has present tense life, but not just any life. It has the, the, the adjective everlasting. You hear right now, you believe right now, right now you have everlasting life. You can't terminate something that's everlasting, but it gets better. Shall not come into, at no time in the future, shall never ever come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. Past perfect tense of the Greek verb means it happened in the past. The results remain till today. It's never going to change. It's a permanent life. You see, that's why our work as Christians, that's why we should be prepared and we should participate and we should be productive. It's the most important work in all the world because nothing, nothing, nothing else will ever produce eternal results except that, except that. There are other verses that build into it. I love reading John chapter 10, 27 through 30, where Jesus says, no one can pluck them out of my Father's hand. No one can pluck them out of my hand. I and my Father are one. Nobody can take you away from me once you belong to me. Ephesians 1, 13, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of promise. We are sealed. We're going, we're, we won't be open until we get to our destination, which is heaven. And I love Romans 8, 38 and 39. You have to read it yourself to get the full uh, impact of it. But what it, go, it goes through a list of things, which if you read that list of things, look at it and say, now, there's not one single thing in all the created universe can escape that list. But just in case... <laughs> The Holy Spirit said, no other, <laughs> in case anything does fall through these cracks, no other thing can ever separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. It's a permanent life. It's worth having. It's worth participating in. It's worth sharing. It's newness of life. Well, you know, preacher, I've got three of those down pat, but there's a couple of them I'm a little weak on. Go back and compare your life before you, ever got sa you got saved. You didn't prepare. Now your new life you should be preparing. Before you were saved, you didn't participate. You now have a new life. You should participate. That's newness. That's different from the old life, right? Before you got saved, you never produced anything for God, for his kingdom. New life you should be produce, producing. And understand that the results of what you produce will be permanent. If you lead someone to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Pray with me, please. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the wonderful assurances we have in the Holy Bible. That once you have purchased us with the shed blood of Jesus Christ, not one single thing on earth can strip us out of your hands. We're yours forever. And in that relationship with you, Lord, we have such great and wonderful opportunities, exciting opportunities to participate with you to participate with our fellow Christians and doing great things for the kingdom of God in attacking Satan's world out there and bringing his children into God's family as God's children. We have that always before us. We have the joy, Lord, of walking in newness of life, knowing where that newness is going to take us, to a home in heaven with you. And, Lord, we have the privilege of taking people with us. Help us commit ourselves now to making the most of this newness of life. And, Lord, if there's anyone in here this morning who does not yet know Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, Maybe they prayed a little believer's prayer as a child and they never ever considered the issue of repentance. They know what it means at this point to turn their life over to you, to turn away from their sin and turn to you. Touch their heart this morning, Lord. Tell them what they need to do and help them have the courage to do it as we sing our hymn of invitation. We thank you, Lord, for all you've done in us, all you want to do, all you're going to do if we'll just participate and cooperate with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise team, please lead us. I'm here at the front. If you want to speak with me, you can come right now. Or you can wait till after the service and come then. It's up to you. I want you to do whatever God is telling you to do right now.
loved and broken for my regard. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well. Even when my eyes can't see, and this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. Thank God for our wonderful praise team excelling again today as they always do and leading us in worship. Thank you, folks. Great job. Uh, the little business cards you can give to your Italian friends, whoever makes your cappuccino and serves you croissant or whatever, your landlord, whoever, you, any Italian-speaking person you're concerned about their eternal life, give them one of those cards, ask them to go to that website, read the articles that are on there. I, I publish one every Tuesday and every Saturday, so there are four up there already. Uh, ask them maybe to read them in order, but anyway, it doesn't matter. The biblical truth is right there for them to see. 
Brother Ryan going to come down and lead us in our closing prayer. Go your way rejoicing. I'm still around. I'll be right here if you have anything you want to say to me before you go. Uh, any question you want to ask, I'm here for you. But right now, Brother Ryan, lead us in prayer. Go your way rejoicing. Have a great week in the Lord. Amen. Peace, our heads, brother.